center. And then, and then <clears throat> cover crops and companion crops. I hear so many times in my day job about, um, you know, I want to go an, an annual cover crop. Why do you want to go an annual cover crop? Well, I want to take my perennial stand out and I want to go a cover crop and improve my soil health. A perennial stand will just as do as good in a diverse perennial stand as what an annual cover crop will. So they're both cover crops. So if you can say, okay, I'm in a cropping situation, then fair enough, let's do, do um, cover crop in, in a rotation like this but if you're in a perennial and you don't farm but you want to you want to have a cover crop if you've got an old perennial stand that needs taking out okay put a cover crop in for a year or two and that's it don't keep doing cover crops because it's trendy put a good legume based grass stand in there predominantly more legumes i prefer than than grasses deep rooted drought tolerant high feed quality there's so many advantages of a good perennial stand. So don't be drawn in by, you know, put a perennial, put an annual stand in a perennial stand and it'll prove your perennial stand. I haven't seen that work. I have a custom seeding business as well. And I've tried on my place and several other guises and we just don't see it. Um, we need a soil test to see what fertility we've got in the soil to make those annuals or perennials work too. So the soil health side of things, anything to get livestock back on the soil. We've got to get that soil back to the way it was, you know, a thousand years ago before we wiped out the bison. So the soil health is, is not just cover crops. People say grow a cover crop and improve soil health. Without closing the circle with livestock, it's going to take you twice as long and you're going to uh, cost you twice as much. If you can grow a crop to graze, you're getting killing two birds with one stone. You're helping to improve the soil quality and you're feeding livestock, which is also starting to um, improve soil quality. So the two, and, the two go together. You've got to have them working together. Don't go a cover crop just to plow it down. I can't see it financially working for us or, or a lot of guys I work for without having some sort of system where you've got a, you, two uses at it with the livestock and the crop growing together and uh, working in harmony with that. Nutrient recycling, that's coming from the cattle. We just talked about that. There's your biggest bang for your buck right there. Even in a perennial stand, if you can small, have smaller paddocks, more quicker rotations, then nutrient recycling is gonna come from your livestock. So that's something you should really think about is, okay, wh where's my best bang from a buck? I've already got a good perennial stand. Maybe I need to put electric fences up and make my paddocks smaller and have more intense rotations. Um, and then we've got integrated livestock. Like we've talked about this a couple of times now. This has got to be part of your operation. Even if you're a straight cropping guy, work with a cattle guy. Don't charge him for the rent of the land because what he's bringing to you, and Grant will talk about this tomorrow, the amount of nutrient that he's bringing to your land, you've, you've got to appreciate what the value of that is. I know a couple of guys around in Saskatchewan who are doing, doing uh, land share deals. The cropping guy saying, look at you come and put your cattle on here for two years. All you have to do is put the crop in and a single hot wire around and, and you can have it. So this is where integrating livestock on your soil for, for you cropping guys is find a good partner and a guy who's, who understands what you're trying to achieve and he's in the same mindset. And then livestock husbandry, fit the livestock to what you're going to use it for. Doesn't matter if it's a sheep or cattle, bison, elk, goats, work with the livestock that's going to be best for your situation. Get livestock who are quiet. Make sure your livestock management is worked around the temperament of the cattle first because they can tear through fences. They can be out on the road if you've got a single hot wire. So work with cattle that are very quiet and you work them quietly as well and they want to be around you. You find that when you start this integrated system, the cattle do more following than trying to push them all over the place. So work, work with livestock husbandry as well in this system as well. 
And then water infiltration, I'll show you some great photographs on this um, in the slideshow here. And uh, this is one of our main goals, open up the soil, get organic matter in the soil and bank moisture, especially in these dry years coming. Moisture efficiency, using what we have to make this, to make the forages grow to what we need them to do with what moisture we have. So I don't know if we're getting less moisture in the future or more moisture, but one thing we have to do is bank it. And we can bank it by increasing this organic matter. And then solar panels, we all talk about carbon sequestration. We have to have a living root in the soil as long as possible. We're not getting paid at the moment. I don't know if we ever will because it's so political but at least we're doing something for our soil, banking um, uh, carbon into the soil, which improves the soil, which improves the forages. And then rest time. This is one of the biggest things. Paddocks don't have to be used in a grazing situation year after year after year. If you can let one paddock just rest for a whole year, it's setting seed, it's rejuvenating its root system, and then you can move on, uh, use it first thing the following year. The biggest thing with pastures on the perennial side is they don't get a enough time to re reset and re re rejuvenate themselves. So it's like sand point and vetch, birds for tree foil, clovers, all those seed can drop in the ground, the cattle can pack them in a year later. And then you've got your bromes in your orchards and so on and so on. And this is family time. This is a big one with my wife and my girls. Um, I always thought that working together was playing together, but apparently it's not. We've got to have our own separate time. So make sure you set aside time for the family to make this work as well. And then financial management. If you can't afford to go down this track, then take baby steps, do one little thing at a time. It might be splitting the paddock in half with electric fencing. It might be improving the watering system. So the cattle have diverse water from different ends of the property. But this stuff can, at the moment, we're not getting paid to be regenerative. So everything we're doing now is to benefit ourselves. We will not cut out fertilizer. I hear so many people say you, we, you'll cut out your fertilizer. I'll show you experiences I've had over the last 15 years. So fertilizer is a tool in my toolbox. So make sure that you're doing this for the right reasons. It's just not, oh, I'm gonna cut out fertilizer. I'm gonna have better calves. There's always tools in the toolbox that you're going to pull out every now and then. We definitely have cut back on um, chemical fertilizers and sprays, but there's still a tool in the toolbox. And then allowing this system to work, allowing it to take time to figure itself out, you figure it out, see what works on your place and then move on. But it's not going to happen overnight. These, the, I hear so many times, plant this cover crop, you'll need to use fertilizer again. That's not the way it works. Okay, the key to healthy soil is less mechanical disturbance in the soil. I'm big on zero till. We bought our drill out of Australia for our operation. It's very minimal to soil disturbance, but whatever you use, this is one of the big key, uh, key things for regenerative ag and soil health. If you can get a neighbor to use his machinery on your place, you don't have to pay for that iron to sit in the yard and rust for half a year. Uh, leave armor on the soil surface. I, today I was coming up from Fort McLeod and there's a hell of a wind down there and all this topsoil blowing into the ditch, unbelievable amount of topsoil just blowing away. So leave, leave the armor on the soil, whatever you do, either a cropping rotation or grazing. Leaving root in the soil, plant diversity. Have, have different plants in your perennial annual stands. You can still do canola, and then try some peas with it or uh, oats and peas, something like that to change things up and leave a leaving root in the soil as long as possible. We know perennials will do that forever, um, but uh, you've, we've got plants like uh, winter triticale, sweet clover. You know, it's a living root, it's gone dormant, but it's still living longer than a lot of the annual brassicas and clovers. And integrate livestock in the soil, we've talked about that, and then nutrient recycling. Okay, I'm gonna start on from the very beginning for us and where we first saw this. And this was before cover crops was a word. This was in 2006 or 2005. We headed home to Australia for, uh, for a holiday and we went through New Zealand. 
And in Australia, I used to use turnips, but I kind of went away from them up in Canada. I didn't think they'd suit the system. And coming down here to David's place, this is down at um, on the um, Canterbury Plains uh, on the South Island, New Zealand. This is, this is a cover crop, but it's not a cover crop. It's, it's diverse. It's got clovers, it's got wheat, it's got brassicas in there. It's got turnips, forage rape, and, uh, and a white clover and some um, oats. And actually it's got some wheat in there as well. But this wasn't a cover crop. This is high, um, high nutritional nutrient dense feed. And this is when the light switched on to me. I wanted something better for my winter swath grazing. I just did triticalian oats and I, I wanted my calves to stay longer. I wanted to, to sell my calves in a different time of the year, but I wanted to keep them on the cow. We calve May, June and we, uh, January, February is when we, when we uh, wean. So I'm selecting another market. So I bought some seed up from New Zealand and started cover, crop, cover cropping. And I, I didn't call it that, I call it nutrient dense feeding. And so we've been doing this for quite a while and now we've kind of put a practice on it. So David's got sheep and cattle and what you can't see on this picture are the cattle are ahead of the sheep. So he's keeping the cattle moving forward and the sheep are following. Then he comes back around the front here, does a rotation, he's going back again. And these guys, they do have the growing season. You know, they can grow crops all year round well, we've got to condense this into a four or five months period. So yeah, it's, it's been around for a while. We've all been concerned about soil health uh, and, uh, and improving our soil, but we've been doing it for quite a while, a lot of us. And this is my uh, mate in Scotland. Um, this family has been on this particular farm since the 1700s. This place has always had some sort of crop diversity for winter grazing. So David Bask, uh, not David, um, Rob Neal is south of Edinburgh. He's a Nuffield scholar. He's been doing these kind of practices for I don't know how many generations, but this is what he's doing to fertilize the soil, give the cattle some uh, winter grazing, get them out of the sheds before he puts them in the shed and finishes them off in feedlots. So their, their feedlots are all in the shed. So you can see in the background there, um, there's all the crop grazed off, but they're rocks. So what he's got to stop soil compaction, he's got a fence behind those cattle, so they can't go back on the grass they've already, uh, the forages they've already um, grazed. And then he's got a laneway that goes down to water when they need it. So this has been going on for generations. So getting the livestock back on the soil is not that new. I think we've just faded out of it because um, of technologies. We've been listening to the big companies, the big pharmaceutical companies saying we need to do that, not pharmaceuticals, um, farm input companies saying that, you know, we need to do this more efficiently, more, you know, that more efficiently, and we kind of faded out. So this is kind of what we do through the winter. We're feeding two lots of livestock. I'm feeding cattle on top of the soil and root systems underneath the soil. What you can see here, we've got urine spots right here, 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 and then manure everywhere else. And look at the litter on this soil. So we're leaving some litter there to protect it. It's gonna get taken in by the worms. The manure is gonna break it down. We don't harrow this at all. By the time halfway through summer, we can hardly find any manure. It's all gone back down into the soil. And that's where we start feeding these guys here. So we're, my main job is to feed the livestock first that are above the soil and everything livestock underneath the soil, that's a bonus, which produces a better forage I'm on top. So that's how we're getting livestock integrated back to cut our fertilizer costs, but I'll never eliminate our fertilizer cost. I'll show you some slides here later on that what happened when we stopped using fertilizer, but we have reduced the cost of fertilizer. So you've all heard of mycorrhizal fungi and rhizobia bacteria. Union Forage was the first company in North America to apply mycorrhizal spore and rhizobia to all our seeds. The farm, the farm systems we've had in the past, we've farmed it all out with cultivation. So we're introducing it back in. We've got mycorrhizal spore in our brassicas, even though brassicas don't host mycorrhizal fungi. This oats plant right here 
that was uh, uh, some oats in our winter swath grazing that was not treated with mycorrhizal, but the uh, forage rape, the Goliath and Winford forage rape had mycorrhizal and it went and found a parent, a uh, partnership, sorry. And so we can tell we got mycorrhizal on here because the secretion and the soil clinging onto the roots. You'll never see mycorrhizal with a human eye, but this is a really good indication. And, and Nicole Masters pointed out this to me years ago when she was up. So it's, an inter, it's a symbiotic relationship. It's a parasite that attaches itself to there and milks the plant, but the plant is milking it because it's going further than the root system and getting micronutrients from further away in the soil. It's a food web. And then 4010 forage peas, we know all about that. If you don't inoculate them, you haven't got any, any uh, uh, nitrogen nodulations for the future. And an easy way to look to say, is my soil healthy? Have a look how many guys these guys are here. If you can open up a shovel of soil and see at least that many with, without breaking it all open, you know your system's starting to work really well. So you can get your soil test. We can do all that um, with, the, with the Heaney test. And a good friend of mine, um, Daryl, he, he looks at this. This is his job. He can come and tell me what's happening. But if I can open up my soil and I see worms, I know I'm on the right track. This particular land has been in Heather's family for 80 to 100 years, uh, over 100 years. And when we first took this over, we could find no worms. But it's taken 15 years. Well, actually, it's more than that now. It's probably 20 years now where we can dig up any soil and find worms on this on this uh, cropland. Now, this picture, we have to concentrate on this. This is something that really gets under my skin. I see so many companies out there saying, oh, look what the root systems do to the soil. This is what a root system does to your soil. This is what we promote soil health. I, this one thing you see with this, it's a drawing. Both of them are drawings. It's somebody's interpretation of, of, a, um, of a plant. You notice one is from New Zealand, one is from England. They can grow crops for 12 months a year. It's like day and night, okay? So a uh, really obvious one here, we can't grow this amount in an annual what compared to what other people can in their countries of origin where these plants all belong. This plant is a chicory right here. Okay, so this is the Kiwi's interpretation of a chicory. Okay, here's the English interpretation of a chicory. Can two completely different things, okay? So that's what you've got to be careful of. If you've got a guy coming around talking to you about diversity of crops in your soil, and he brings out something like this, You've got a question, how do you know that? Well, it's here on the map, he can show you. Here's, here's Lucin, which is alfalfa. Here's a sand foin. There's some Timothy. Here's some um, tillage. Uh, this is, what's that one? I can't see that. I can't see that one, the screen's holding it. This one really, this is a beet. So I'm not sure if they're talking fodder beets or sugar beets. There's no way in hell that that's the size of a sugar beet. A sugar beet isn't grown to have a little bulb like that. The sugar beet is huge. It's as big as your head. And even with a fodder beet, it's as big as your head as well. So be careful when you've got someone talking to you about having different uh, fruit systems in the soil, and this is what they're promoting, ask them to show you. Okay, here we go. This is chicory right here. Look at the root system on chicory. Really, this is after one year's growth. Chicory, and this is plantain. Chicory and plantain in their countries of origin are perennials. So this is after uh, about five months of growing. So you can imagine this five years from now, how big these root systems were, are. So if you want a really big organic matter, look at, look at uh, the chicory right here, or more fibrous with the plantain. These are some of the best forages you can plant but they don't last here in Canada. So, you know, you think, okay, I'll have them for a year or two and that's about it. But these grow back like lightning. You can graze these and 20 days later, you're growing them back again. So mix these with Italian ryegrass, you're really off to the races. But this is just giving you a bit of indication of root systems there. Guys say, oh, let's plant more legumes 
in our in we have a lot of legumes in our blend. Let's uh, let's get you more nitrogen fixing. Here's 4010 forage peas. Okay, this crop is over here at uh, Linden. This crop is only three months old. This crimson clover is in the same paddock with these uh, peas. And look at this. You can't really see here, but there's only one, two nitrogen nodules here. Look at these, all down every root system. We've got nitrogen nodules appearing all over the place. So if you want a true legume to fix nitrogen, don't use your hairy vetch, your crimson clover, your, your uh, bursine clover. We have these all in our blend, but we're not promoting nitrogen fixing with them. We're, tr we're promoting feed quality with them. So if you say, no, that's not my gig, I really want more nitrogen, look at a cheap 4010 forage pea. They will do more for you than, as you can see, crimson clover. All these clovers and hairy vetches are perennials in their countries of origin, okay? So they can, they can set next year and the year after, have bigger root systems, big, more nitrogen deposits than what you can get. Um, they, will, they will be year after year where these guys will know they have to get up and grow, reproduce themselves, drop the seed on the ground and supply a fertilizer package for the young seedlings for the following year. These guys, they think they got all year to do it, uh, uh, four or five years to do it. So be careful with that. Here's hairy vetch. It's just starting to have some nitrogen nodules on, on it right here and right there. But this plant is, a, at the top of this plant, it's about three foot tall. Great plant, really good plant. Um, but don't expect a lot of nitrogen fixing the first year. If it survives the second year, then you'll start seeing nitrogen fixing. This is Italian ryegrass, big, massive. This is one seed, guys. Look at how much foliage that Italian ryegrass has and the roots from one seed. All these are one seed. But this is the thing that keep, keep your eye on the game and decide what you're going to do and why you're going to do it. And here we go with the brassicas. So you've got your uh, green globe, purple top, and green globe again. Oh, this might be New York or green globe, I forget now. Um, so, you know, big bulby plants, and these are pulled out halfway through summer. So by the end of fall, these, especially these purple tops and green globes, they can be as big as, almost as big as your head. So from one seed, we get this kind of biomass below and, a, and above the soil. Here we have some triticalian oats. This is hunter forage turnip. This is from New Zealand. It's a, it's a, um, a crossbred between a turbot, turnip and a cabbage. They've taken the Asian cabbage, they've taken the root system out. And as you can see, put more foliage on and can be grazed multiple times. And here's Goliath forage rape. So when you hear a guy say, oh, it's got a forage brassica, the word brassica is Latin for all these guys. So you've got to ask them, well, what's a forage brassica? Well, it's forage brassica, it's green and it grows like a turnip. No, no, the, the whole system is the whole word is a family for all a word for these families right here but if you say is it a forage rape or is it a forage turnip or is it a, a bulb turnip then you can get more pacific but the point is i'm making here look at the different root systems okay so that's something to be careful of in the future for you so here we have what is a brassica you've got your swedes your rates your canolas your tillage radishes you've got cauliflower cabbage um, turnips, spinach, uh, kohlrabis, kale, beets. So all these things all over here belong in the brassica family. I see so many things saying it's a, it's a, a um, oh, what's that one? Uh, there's a one in the US they're using, collards. Collards is in, even registered for a cattle feed. It's a vegetable that they use in salads and soups down there. So be careful when you say, you know, oh, we've got a brassica. What is it? It's a collard. Ask questions. Why is it a collard? And then we've got your forbs, chicory and plantains. A lot of people have said these are brassicas. They're not. They're, they're actually forbs. Okay. Keeping the blend simple. Like some of the things that I've seen work best here, I don't believe in having six or seven plants in a blend. It's got to be 
you know, you've, everybody's got to have room to grow. Everybody can't compete. Sorgs and millets, they hate being crowded in. So, and then Italian ryegrass only gets up to your calf muscle. So select what you need. So this is just a ballpark of what really works here that we've found across the prairies and into Ontario, in Southern Ontario, Southwestern Ontario. So, you know, you might only select a couple of these. You might put some oats and triticale and peas. That's a cover crop. You know, you're having diversity. You might say, okay, I need some, I'm in South, uh, Southern Saskatchewan. You know, I might go peas and sorghum and a bit of millet and a goliath forage rate. They'll all compete with each other. One thing with these plants here, the goliath forage rate, the Winfred and the sorghums, those plants will go dormant and, and hibernate. If they get dry, like last year, instead of trying to bolt like cereals and canola, they will just go dormant. They'll sit there and they will hang on until they get some rain. And if they don't get rain, they'll just die. And you'll find when you get a shower or a, or a half inch or an inch of rain, all of a sudden the plants explode because underneath the soil, they've been mining for moisture and nutrient, but they haven't wasted it by coming up to putting more leaves on. And now they have to support more leaves above the soil. So keep that in mind. You know, the sunflowers are great. Um, all this stuff, all this stuff here will bring in the elk and deer. That's one of our biggest problems here is um, deer and elk. Well, not so much here, but deer is a lot here, but not so much the elk. But yeah, if you have a baseline of some of these, um, yeah, that works well, you know. I'm not into, um, but guys say, oh, we put more pollinators in. Are you in the cattle business or the bee business? If you have bees, fair enough, okay? But if you're in the beef business, look at the beef, look at your goal. You're trying to feed those animals more efficiently. So in here, we have not got any pollinators, but look at all the pollinators. We've got daikon radish, we've got cloves, we've got hairy vetch. You know, there's enough pollinators in here that will carry a bee far enough. We have beehives here on, um, that, a, that a guy um, puts on the place and I don't put anything that I can't use for my cattle in my swath grazing. And he's getting 20% more yield out of these paddocks. Admittedly, we've got perennials on one side of the property. So we've got Sandpoint and Vetch Alfalfa. And then, um, so they're getting that as well, but I'm not supplying him with what he needs. I'm supplying what, what, what I need. So keep your eye on the target with this. Okay, these are some of the advantages of cover crops and uh, it's kind of an ongoing thing. Um, we can uh, really, uh, I'm gonna drag this down a bit. Um, this is an ongoing target, like this uh, cover crop, it's new. We're finding all the pros and cons of what's going on, you know, the, the, and every day this list changes. So, you know, some cover crops can be grazed multiple times. This is pretty much true with everything, but if you take a sunflower out, it's done, okay? If you go and take, um, break a bulb on a turnip, this is why we use hardcore turnips, not soft core turnips, the bulb is done. So you've lost the grazing ability there too. They'll get a good grazing out of it, but if it busts open, it's done, okay? So there's, there's plants out there, Italian ryegrass, chicory plantain, the sorghums, the, the forage rapes, they can all be grazed multiple times. Take it down about six or seven inches and she'll come back pretty quick. The root systems, everything we do, you know, it doesn't matter if it's a small root system or a large root system, it's all adding organic matter to the soil. Most of these things that, that I use and, and some of the others use, the, um, we're mostly using cool seasons. We do have our C4s with the sunflowers and sorghums and millets but mostly we can get good longer seasons with a mixture of cool and warm season crops. High digestibility, these cattle and sheep and livestock do really, really well on it. It's, you'll put pounds on cattle, you'll milk the cows to put the uh, pounds on carbs. I'll show you some feed tests here coming up. Quick growing, most of them, you know, under the right conditions, irrigation or moisture, we're looking at four to six weeks 
uh, after seeding. Italian ryegrass and hunter uh, and chicory and plantain are the quickest. Livestock get started on it with no hesitation. This is something you've got to be careful of here. If you're bringing cattle from, say, dry crested wheat, intermediate wheatgrass, say some perennial pasture is pretty dry halfway through summer, introduce the cattle slowly because they'll get fog fever and pneumonia and they'll die because the rumen's not adjusting and taking all that nutrients and overload. So just be careful. When, take a week and introduce these cattle slowly, use an electric fence, let them to creep in, and then, uh, and then you'll be fine. But um, if they've come from lush perennial pastures, lots of legumes should integrate pretty easily. Uh, can be seeded into sod after Roundup. This can be, I, I would do, if you had an old perennial pasture sand you'd take it out, I would put straight oats and triticale in the first year. It's cheap. It'll allow the root systems from the previous stands to break down. And, it'll, and it won't cost you an arm and leg if something goes wrong, okay? And then next year, you can put some more organic plants in there and then put it back to perennial pasture stands, okay? You can't beat a perennial stand. And likes well-drained soil. I've heard some guys say brassicas love, love wet areas. They hate wet areas, absolutely hate it. Um, you, and the pH is a good wide range there. So, you know, you can seed, you know, two or three pounds of, uh, two or four pounds of a forage rape and a, and, a, um, and a cereal, you know, a little bit of nitrogen, always get a soil test, especially this day and age with fertilizer costing so much. So keep an eye on that. Keep an eye on that, because you, you don't want to spend more than you, what, what you absolutely have to. And the price range, we can look at a dollar fifty nine per pound, or up to five dollars fifty a pound, or even even higher. So um, that's something to keep an eye on. Watch your goal. Watch your efficiency. If it's dry cows, you know you weaned in in November December. Don't worry about having too much in there because the rest is just going to be bypassed, which is still good for the soil, but you're paying for something, right? And it holds its feed value for a long time. Like I've. Uh, um, uh, checked my swaths when I, I get my mineral made up every year for what my swaths tell me I need. Um, and so um, this kind of feed I've tested in November and I've tested in January. It's just dropped a couple of points in protein, the same with, um, with the TDN. So this is something that, uh, you know, it can hold its feed a long time. Adds a ton of biomass into the soil. This is one of the things with cover crops we've got to really look at. If you've, got, if you've got poor soil, anaerobic soil, we need aerobic, we need the soil to breathe, we need the life form in the soils to get going and the water holding capacity. More organic, more, uh, more organic in the soil, the bigger the water holding capacity. We'll talk about that in a little while here too. Helps improve the biodiversity in the soil with the different root types rotting in the soil. We talked about that. Good cocktail mix should have an annual uh, legume, brassica, and some warm season grasses. But that's all depends where you're at. If you're along the foothills where I am, the only warm season I got is the sunflower. I cannot get sorghums and millets to grow in my area. But you go to cross to Brooks or into Saskatchewan or southern Manitoba, then the warm seasons might be your dominant um, plant in the forage mix. Okay. And most importantly is feed the cattle the best you possibly can. That's my main goal in our operation is to cut my feeding costs, but give them a good quality feed. We'll go into the, um, we'll go into the uh, cons here in a minute. But this is some of my soil. we have got a worm there. This, the night, be, the two days before this photograph was taken, we had nearly four inches of rain in, in it was 2019, okay? I've still got tons of aerobic activity going in the soil. The worms are still living. They're not coming up to the soil. If your soil is a waterlogged, you'll see worms all over the place trying to get out and breathe here. Okay, so this is what happened with the soil. This is the day after the rain quit. This is across the road from this paddock right here. Heather and I have been swath grazing on this place um, 20 years now, 15 years of cover crops. And this is across the road, continually cropped, no fences, you can see, continually cropped barley canola. Look at the moisture that's piled up on this land. 
You can see there's a slope coming down here, but we've got a slope coming down from here. This is the old homestead here, coming down into this ponding area. But look at the moisture still sitting up on the soil here. So we're banking a lot more. And I learned this statement here at college, for every 1% organic matter, we've got 45,000 litres of water holding capacity. Every kid in Australia has driven home this number because we're a land of drought and flooding rains. So if we can improve this by 1% every couple of years, then we're off to the races. I'm gonna show you a soil test from this paddock here. Um, we've taken this from 2.8 to 9.2, but it's taken nearly 20 years to get there actually. So, but we've improved it all the time. This is, what, this is after that rain event and neighbor. You can see all the flooding coming down here, but look at all this topsoil, man. Like this is unbelievable. And this is asset that's been building up over generations up here. And we've just had one loose rain event, no litter holding the soil together. And then we're getting washed. Or we can have it something like this. This is the highway west of Strathmore. This guy's cultivating, he's speed disking this paddock and not even realizing what he's doing here. All this asset that he's blowing off the farm. Okay, keeping a living root in the soil longer, getting photosynthesis in the soil, getting carbon sequestration in the soil. This is a barley crop that was seeded. It's not a barley, it's a silage crop that was seeded um, in, in uh, May. Uh, and so this is getting ready to take off. Well, not yet, but it was silaged uh, towards the end of August. And this is the same crop again right here. Okay, so October 31st, we took the silage off. We got 11 and a half tonnes the acre. Normally you just have the barley kind of, the stuff that comes to head later on, really sparse, but we've got this underneath growth here. This costs $34 an acre to add into this silage. But now we've got a silage off there. And now we're going to graze well into Christmas on here. So this is a really neat thing we can look at is keeping that living root in the soil longer and get us more grazing days per acre. Keep those cows out longer. They're shitting and pissing all over this soil. What's wrong with that? Keep them out of the pens. So, okay, here we go with some of the disadvantages. Too much legumes, we can call bloat. We all know that. The brassicas do not cause bloat. But it's something to look at that if you've got a, you know, a clover-based uh, cover crop, keep an eye on it. Very, very high feed quality, but just keep an eye on, you know, um, the cattle and, and uh, the grazing techniques you're using. Weed control. We will get weeds. I've seen really good uh, cover crops still getting weeds in there. So there's no weed control. We can take it off as green feed or silage and capture those flowers from the weeds before they start um, producing seed. Or we can get in there and graze it and trample it and something like that. If you're in a high club root area, do not grow brassicas. We can still use other crops like clovers, hairy vetch, peas, cereals. That's still a cover crop. So we'll keep an eye on that because brassicas, as you know, is, is a is a, a relate, relative to canola and you'll still harbor uh, club root in your soil. If you've got high sulfur in your water, if you can smell sulfur in your water, your stock water, be careful, do not grow brassicas. They, they are a sulfur hog. They'll store it in their cells of their leaf. Cattle eat it and they'll get um, livestock polio where the brain swells and the cattle start walking in circles. And a couple of days later, well, three or four days later, they'll be dead. You can combat this with thiamine in the mineral, which will combat it very well, but it adds, it adds a cost. So if you're willing to take the risk and you work with a good nutritionist, figure this out and say, okay, I do have it, but I do want to feed. So make the mineral to what uh, with thiamine, uh, put thiamine in the mineral for the need of the plant. Like I said before, it dislikes wet feet. It, the, the brassicas hate wet feet. So you may as well use clover and Italian ryegrass and cereal. Make sure you've got a really good mineral package. We, we mineral for every day of the year. We do a summer mineral on what our forages need through the summer and we do a winter mineral as well. And you'll usually find that this 
getting it made for what you need is a lot cheaper than buying it off the shelf on a bulk um, one type of mineral at, at uh, UFA or co-op or nutrient, the Cargill mineral. I've saved a lot of money by getting our mineral made for what we need for our soil, uh, for our grazing. If, this, if uh, we have high nitrate issues, the, every one of these plants, perennial land, you'll, you'll have a hell of a problem with nitrate poisoning. Um, I've seen um, high nitrate tests in 1600 parts per million and the cattle have actually survived. And what the nutritionists are telling us, because we've got such a high quality feed, we've exploded the biology in the rumen. So it is eating, eating, eating that nitrates instead of letting it get into the blood system. So we can have a bit of a buffer there, but it is something to, something to keep an eye on. And this has been the scourge of Southern Alberta in the last years is flea beetles. Just takes them out like nothing else. And I'll show you some pictures of that as well. Okay, so flea beetles. So these are some of the disadvantages that we're, and, and there's more experiences out there, I guess, with everybody else as well. So it's, it's good to keep in the loop with everyone and see what's happening. Okay, this is not all ponies and rainbows. So this is that wet paddock I showed you that's had cattle on there for 20 years. It's had cover crops since 2006, seven, and this is 2016. I started going to conferences. Well, well, I was always going to conference, but I started hearing the cover crops and soil health and no more fertilizers. So I did it. 16, 17, 18, absolute knockout crops. 2019, this happened. We had tons of moisture, really good warm weather. It wasn't hot, it was warm. This is 45 days after seeding. I've never had this happen before in this paddock, that everything was looked really good. And I rang a guy down the States and I said, what the hell is going on here? It's all nitrogen. And he said, oh yeah, just need to add, in, add some nitrogen fertilizer. I said, but you tell us not to use fertilizers anymore. This growth here is 45 days old, okay? That growth there is 45 days old, right there. So I do not not put any uh, crop in now with, with gout getting a soil test and finding out what, what you need. So work with a good agronomist like, and, and make sure that agronomist is an independent. Like Daryl's an independent. He doesn't work for Nutrient or Cargill or whatever. He works, um, he works for himself and you. So make sure you do that. So the next picture here, the day after I took this picture, I went and applied 50 pounds of N, okay? This is 11 days after I applied the N. My operation here with Heather and I, we cannot afford to have a loss of our winter forage. It's costing us around a dollar a day to maintain a cow and 57 cents to maintain that calf on this swath, on this swath grazing. So we've got about 210 acres of swath grazing, but you can see what a little bit of nitrogen did. You know, it kicked this cereal, the brassicas, everything started kicking back into life. So this is something I'm telling you guys, don't think that you're gonna cut out the fertilizer program. It's gonna be your tool in the toolbox. That's why $70 for a soil test is, is a really worth it for the long-term goals. Flea beetles, this is the picture. It should be back a couple, but this is what we found this year. Tons of flea beetles. Weed control, can you imagine controlling anything in here? You've got some white cockle here, but there's some daikon radish in here as well, but there's some white cockle. So all we did was um, just took it off as green feed, got the cattle in there. So no weed control in cover crops. They will come. Simple little blend. This is the very first year we started using the Winford forage rape with oats. Simple blend. This really changed our operation. These cattle were fat as fools coming um, into spring. I started having calving problems. So now what I do is keep the calves until January, February to drag these cows down. I use an electric fence every morning. Um, Heather and I go different directions. We move fences and we're done. But I found with this, with these kind of blends like this, I had to keep the calves on to drag the cows down. It was very, very high feed value. I'm just gonna go back and show you something real quick here. This canola here is on the same, uh, uh, half section land. I'm going to show you a soil test. So remember this when we come to the soil test picture. OK, 
Okay, holds its value. We talked about that earlier. I got a feed test coming up here. So this is the first year I played with this. So we got rape and oats, the, the Winfred and oats, triticale. It should be trip there too, but oats. So we're looking at uh, 16.2, 68. Here we just got our barley oats. And that's what it is. This is across the road. It wasn't our swaths, but I just took it from another guy's swaths. That's what he is. Say almost the same fertilizer package. But if I can do this, this is also doubling my grazing days because I can slow the electric fence down. I can do, instead of 24 hour shifts, I can do 36 hour shifts because the body can only use so much, right? So this is something that we do every year is get a, um, get a soil test and a feed test to go along with it. Okay, the canola paddock I was talking about on the same half section land, no livestock integration whatsoever, okay? The organic matter down here is only around about that two, it's still around 2.8 there. It hasn't moved at all. And here's where the cattle are. You can see why we need nitrogen. Is my biology eating so much nitrogen that, that the plant doesn't get enough and we need to feed two? We need to feed the biology and the, and the, uh, uh, the plants at the same time. But look at my NPKS. Calcium's up there, don't have to worry about calcium in there and mag, it's getting a little high. But look at the evenness of this blend with uh, this uh, soil sample compared to what we have here. This has got livestock. This is not cover crop. I'm not putting this down solely to cover crops. It's got livestock integration. Okay, the blends, you know, simple little blends like this with some cereals and grasses. Doesn't have to be complicated. This photograph was taken in October. Simple, no problems. Here's a great one, especially for the years like this going into drought or coming out of drought. This is one of the cheapest feeds, cover crops slash whatever you want to call it, that you can put in. Some sweet clover and winter triticale. You can get two kicks at the can at this. Both, you know, pretty tough plants, taproot with the sweet clover really aggressive hybrid vigor with the triticale. So that's a win-win all around. This crop here had 40 head of cattle on it. This is not far from my place. We put 40, we put this fall triticale and the sweet clover in May, 2020. We grazed the heck out of it all uh, 2020. Then 2021, this is the growth in the spring. Then we took a silage crop off there as well. Then the cattle went back and cleaned up. Then we put, we put a uh, back into straight winter triticale again. So it doesn't have to be complicated is what I'm saying. Rapid growth. This is three weeks later, okay? So, you know, you get the plant started or you graze it, take half, leave half, and then, you know, back again. Once we have a root system established, it's a game changer for your grazing operation. Little, little canola coming up there from previous years, but it's uh, still good grazing too. This is a good friend of mine up at Manning, um, Jack Stahl, Twin Rivers Colony. He grows a cover crop to give his perennials a break in the middle of summer. The perennial stands over here in the bush. He grows this to, to give the perennial stand a break. And he's getting cattle back on his cropland. This, this crop got a little far ahead of him, not a big deal. We can graze it down and grow again, but we still haven't let it go to pod yet. So we're still getting on top of it. There's some of the oats in here is gone, but um, it was just something that he used to give a rest period for here, for over there in the perennials. This is pretty hard to see. You know, if you're doing the right thing, if, you, if you've all heard about the cotton underwear or a cotton shirt or whatever, this is, this is what you can see without it. All this leaf matter dropping on the soil and see all the fungi here, like those little white things, that's all fungi. So we've got a living organism on our soil, taking all this litter and taking it back into the soil. Okay, so this is a paddock here that this year it's just going into straight triticale and, um, and rape because you can see the wild oats cutting to take over here in this particular corner. So don't think that, you know, cover crops is going to um, save everything. If you've got an issue, where you've got invasive weeds coming in, take a, take a handle of it. Just do trip or not 
rape or just use rape and not trit or something like that, that you can use Avidex. And this is just showing the regrowth. So that's the growth. There's the swath there. This is the regrowth after a swath a couple, about a month or so later. But this picture is showing, you know, wild oat issues. Um, take it down. Use some uh, different tools in your toolbox the following year to get that under control. Okay, so mid-October after a few frosts, you can see some oats here, the Italian ryegrass here, but the brassicas are still green first um, snow of the season. You can see this is just before Christmas, but this is frozen solid. It's, it, you can crackle it in your hands, um, but green is good. It's locked all that nutrient in the leaf system. But you can see the oats here, it's shimmied the, the leaves, the seed has fallen out and now it's on the ground. So all you've got is a dry stalk here with a bit of husk. But if you have a mix like this, you, you're off to the races, no problems at all. This is showing how quick and how tough forage rapes are. This is Goliath forage rape. This is planted in the vegetable garden. We got it late that year. This is the first time we got Goliath up to Canada. So this was seeded, as you can see there in August. And this photo was taken uh, in September, you know, a little under a month apart, still growing. We had our frost, we had some snow. And this is October 23rd. It's not its full height, the Goliath, but that just shows you what sort of damage that can go through and keep growing. This is the beauty about using brassicas because in Australia and New Zealand, brassicas are a winter growing crop down there. So we seed them in May and graze them through the winter to, for winter forages for the, for the um, winter growing season. So this is just showing you the hybrid vigor of some of these crossbred plants between the, the kale and a turnip is produces a Goliath and Winford forage rapes. So they got hybrid vigor, can get up and go, just like an F1 cow. And this is what really, you know, if you want to make this all work, start to get used to electric fencing. It doesn't have to be complicated. If you don't have power close by, make a simple energizer like this. You've got a 300 and $80, $400 energizer for dual energizer. You've got a solar panel at, at Canadian Tire. It costs um, about the time $75. It's 75 watts, so a buck a watt and a battery, you know. So here you, for, for under seven, eight, nine hundred dollars $900, you've got a really efficient mobile power system that you can start dividing your paddocks up and getting grazing, uh, extending a grazing period, right? So You've got to have good ground rods. Make sure you've got three or four. Make sure they're galvanized and have the, you know, a good size battery for when you get foggy days. You can last on this battery about four days before she plays out. But normally we don't get that long here, but, you know, you never know. So once you start this system, look into something like this. Learn about electric fencing. Don't use anything that's in the steel box. Steel box energizers are the worst one you can buy. They're cheaper, but they sweat. And the solenoids, not solenoids, the, yeah, solenoids in the, in the um, I forget what they're called, but the terminals inside the energizer will start rusting out because steel, as you know, sweats, and then it'll start uh, rusting out the electronics in the system, to, uh, corroding the electric ele uh, electricity, the the electric system inside the plat in the side the steel box. So there's only two types of energizers you look at. It's either Gallagher or True Test. They're both Kiwis and they're both very good. So um, if you're going to go to all the trouble, buy buy a more expensive one than a cheaper one. It'll be, you'll be better off in the long run, and you won't have the cattle uh, learning to um, go to a weak energizer, a uh, weak fence, and push through. You know, controlling cattle, single hot wire, you know, we can have them walking all over here and uh, decreasing the grazing days an acre. This is over at Doug Ray's with his, um, over here at Canna, uh, turning his yearlings out on it. These yearlings that year uh, did 1.2 pounds a day and it cost him about 52 cents. But he had the regrowth here, which was able to grow all the bulbs that they, they're able to chew on as well. 
plus he's got the swath grazing right there as well. Okay, these are the few things that, you know, when you're planning your system and you want to start, just use this as a road uh, roadmap here. Get the soil test. You know where you start and you know where you finish. Every couple of years, you can check back and say, geez, look what I'm going organic matter or look what I'm dropping with nitrogen fertilizer. Okay, so this is one of the cheapest things you can guide. Keep records of what your soil's doing. Even if you don't get a Heaney test, just get a basic one and ask for organic um, levels, and then you can use that as a monitor. Fit the forage to the livestock, okay? You don't want um, forages for dry cows that are gonna be high feed value. If you've got calves on, then great, or sheep or goats or bison, you know, fit the forage to what the livestock. And know your length of your rotations. What do you want to do? Do you want to summer graze or do you want to use it for stockpile forages? So most of the plants here, except for the sorghums and C4s, you can plant May until uh, August, okay? If uh, different blends for different needs and fit the crop to the rotation. So if, you, like I was saying before, if you've got club root, think about the brasses you're using. Think about what your um, plant and soil health is. So get your nutrition to your soil test to let you know what you're going to feed here, right? And, and you um, know what your production of dry matter is. Animal husbandry, talk about this. Have quiet cattle, have quiet livestock that they're not causing you dramas by pushing fence all the time. Residue management, always leave something there for the, for the livestock under the soil. And then feed analysis, just see what your feed is doing. Know what your feed is producing. So you know your grazing days per acre, how often you can move a fence or not move a fence. And then keep, uh, keep the soil test corrections for the next crop. Grazing rotations, introduce the stock slowly, get them to be used to it. Once they know what it is, our cows know when they come to swath grazing, they just beat you to the gate. So they know they've had enough of the dry fall feed and they know they're going to swaths. Have a runoff area. <clears throat> so especially in the spring like this, we're still swath grazing now. We'll be swathing until about the middle of April. Have a runoff area for days like we've had the last couple of days with the soil starting to bog off. Have them that they can go off on some rough forage that they're not damaging that as much as what they're getting in here. Um, and also, if you're using three swaths a day or two swaths a day, give in this time of the year, give them only half that in the morning, half in the evening, because if you give them the whole lot, they're going to bog that into the soil, okay? And then allow you all know about the percentage of body weight. 70% of intake, adjust the feed to the production. Um, uh, Residual residue, we talked about that. Class of stock, we talked about that. And it, we've gone through most of this. Foliant fertilizers, I'm not 100% sold on this yet. I haven't used it myself. And I'm just watching what other guys are, are doing in the area and, and across uh, Canada. I get, I, get, I get across a lot of farms in Canada in my day job. Okay, this is going... Um, WA Ranches, the University Ranch. This crop here, um, as you can see, uh, got into August, no growth whatsoever. Remember what I was saying before, these plants are still growing underneath the soil. So we got a bit of rain. This is the 15th of October in the same area, okay? So don't give up on it. Don't go and say, oh, we better put it up, plow it under. If we get rain, it'll shock you. So we had, these many grazing days an acre, we had six paddocks of this. So we're able to get an extra three and a bit, well, round about three months of grazing. If we gave up on this pasture, um, then we would have had to start feeding. The, the university might have plowed it under, but we just stayed the course and this is what we're able to get. And this is Ben Stewart up at Hardesty. So he's, as you can see in this crop here, he's got a lot more sorghums and millet, but this is Hardesty, a lot hotter than I am here. Um, and uh, so adjust the forages to what your climate is. Um, don't use Italian ryegrass in this kind of climate. It'll let you down every time. Um, restrict your clovers, use more peas, things like this, that where it's a bit more harsh environment, 
work with what you got, get to know what foragers do really well, and just do baby steps at the beginning. See what works in your area and then move on from there. It's, it's, not, it's, not, a, it's not rocket science, guys. You know your land better than anybody else. So work with what you have. This is the crop. Um, ben, I actually threw this one in. Ben is only about five foot tall. So he's a really good poster child for sticking in the middle of a crop, but that's what the crop height is generally. Okay, Perry, he uses the brassicas in his silage and he just grazes straight brassicas after the silage comes off, you know, simple little thing. Okay, so that's about it for tonight for me. Um, Grant's going to do the economics tomorrow night. And then, uh, and yeah, and then next week it'll be all on perennials. But I'll go into the chat here. Um, if everybody wants to unmute and ask questions too, um, I have an old perennial pastures there that's been toying and working it up and seeding. Do you, down to cover crops, do you have any advice as to the system of tillage? We're going <laughs> to talk about tillage next week, actually. Good question. So I would spray that out in the fall. That's the best time to spray at any perennial pasture stand. The first year, I wouldn't break it. I wouldn't break it at all. I just put oats in. Just put oats, get a fertilizer test, put the oats in. And then you'll be really surprised how everything around those oats are breaking down, but it's a low cost way to go about it. You could put um, clovers and brassicas and, and C4s and, and oats and triticale in there. But it's a really harsh environment of the soil because there's a lot happening. There's a lot of root matter breaking down in that soil, right? So you want to do it as cheap as possible the first year. Next year, you might put a cover crop in, add some peas, add some uh, um, brassicas and, and more cereal. But I always do it here where I just take the cheapest possible route in case I have a wreck, okay? And so a cereal is going to be a cheapest, cheapest um, way to go. Uh, question here, what did you see? I wish I could have met you over there. Oh, okay. What, do you, what did you see? I wish I could have met you over there. Hmm. Not too sure what Jay wants there, but anyway. Yep, you can come to our place anytime. We've got an open policy here. Um, we can come and look at what we're doing with the foragers. Um, you can see the pros and cons, the things I've done wrong. Um, you come anytime we're, we're, you know, we're not that far away. What do you use to get out? Uh, what do you use to get out to your fields for swath grazing, assuming you don't walk? Ah, I just use a quad. So I move fence every morning. We'll drive down to it. In the wintertime, we've got to pick up and little pick up. We run down, move fence and then get going again. So all I've got in the wintertime is a cordless drill and I've got white Gallagher fiberglass posts they're about as big as your uh, little finger and it's got a it's got about a an 18 inch masonry bit on it it's not 18 inches has to go in the soil just so I don't have to bend over I go about that much in the soil put my fiberglass rod in I'm reeling my wire out as I'm putting my posts in and um, we can feed a couple of hundred head in less than an hour and then the rest of the day is ours so it's really simple Explain wet feet, does that mean irrigation? No, I mean slough areas. Like if you've got wet, boggy soils and you, irrigation loves irrigation, this stuff. But if you've got ponding or areas where there's water sitting for um, many weeks, then don't put brassicas in there, okay? Put Italian ryegrass and clovers, things like that. Uh, saturated soil conditions, yep. Saturated soil, yep. Um, is 50 pound actual nitrogen or, and urea? Yeah, no, it's it's 50 pounds of urea. So 30 pounds, 37 pounds of, of, um, of urea, of, uh, 50 pounds of product and then 37 pounds of actual. But that depends on your soil test. Uh, my bison are not well behaved. No shit, really? That's unusual for bison. Uh, they do not respect uh, temporary electric fences. Yeah, mate, um, Steve, like, you know, you're gonna have to, horses for courses. Um, I work with, uh, well, Ben works with um, Frank McAllister um, and he up at, um, where's he, Holden somewhere? 
and he does about 1,200 acres a year of swath gra of uh, winter grazing, and he just lets them have at it. So no, you don't have to do what what we do with domesticated livestock. If you have to do that, um, Steve, you've got to manage the best way you can. You know, um, there's limitations to all this, and and bison. If you can train your heifers at a young age to electric fencing, then you might have a chance. Uh, my neighbor down the road here, I help him with his bison and man, you gotta be on your toes with him. So yeah, um, bale grazing works. I love bale grazing. I'm gonna talk about that next week. It's the best way to um, fertilize for perennial pasture stands. Um, into various paddocks and winter bale grazing. Yeah, yeah. if winter bale grazing works for you, mate, that's exactly what you've got to do. You can get more fertility on your soil and that'll pay you back tenfold. Uh, I'm, I am trying a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one mix of fish oil. Uh, yeah, I use fish oil and, and um, humic acid in my Roundup. It's I use half a litre um, earthfort, yep. Um, I use half a litre Roundup. Normally you'd use a litre. I use one litre of fish oil and one litre of humic acid. So I'm feeding the soil and killing the plants at the same time, but I'm opening up the plants to provide, um, so it takes in more of the chemical to give it, um, to give it a knockback. So I'm not an expert in this. There's a lot of people out there smarter than me when it comes to this. Um, but I do use humic and fish oil in my Roundup. So, and uh, it breaks the impact, but feeding the soil at the same time. Does this stuff need rain? Shit, yeah, it needs rain. We've got different blends for different needs. So we've got a dry land blend that you can use, um, say, you know, Southern, Southern Alberta, Saskatchewan, Northern Montana, that, you know, it's more C4s and sunflowers and it'll have Goliath forage rape in there too. So um, pick your horses for the race. And so if you've got a really good moisture area, like I'm 11, 12 inches of, of uh, moisture averaging a year, but that, you know, this year was unusual and we suffered like, you know, it wasn't a great year for us. So I actually had cattle fed out on other swath grazing lands at friends of mine. So um, yeah, like in that, in that kind of area where you're kind of dry, use a different kind of crop. Um, why no foliar fertilizer cost? Uh, yeah, hey Grant, um, I don't know, mate. Like, there's better guys out there than me when it comes to foliar fertilizers. I just don't know enough about them. Um, there's like, if you could talk to actually, Grant might know more about it than me. So tomorrow night. It might be a question for Grant or if Grant can chime in now, if he's got an opinion on it, um, he's on the line here too. Um, I'm really up in the air with that. I've heard the pros and cons. I know um, uh, John McAllister, um, is it John McAllister over in, Dr. John over in Saskatoon, Grant? He doesn't believe in foliant fertilizers, but you know, I don't know. You have to do some more research on it. Um, what is the best way to add diversity into a perennial stand? I just, just like, this is a great question. You know what? I'd looked at a paddock today under irrigation, solid Timothy. And all we're going to do is put sandfoin vetch alfalfa into that stand. But what we're going to do, we're going to take that first cut of Timothy off. It's under irrigation. And then um, we're going to take that first cut off. And we'll see how the season goes. We might do a quarter litre roundup or maybe even less. And then straight away, we're going to put 1152 down with the legumes and then lock that paddock up until the following year. That is a really good way of um, rejuvenating the eating of pasture. I've done that lots. I'm going to show that next week. Um, I've done it on our own place here. I've done it with straight legumes. I've added grasses into it. But it can be so easy if uh, we've got irrigation like today was. But if it's dry land next door to this property, then, you know, you've got to pick your battles. If we have a wet year, go for it. Don't buy your seed until you know you've got about, you know, eight, 10 inches of moisture in that soil. And we're having a wet year. So this is one of the things that you get, get, 
get some outside eyes and have a look what's going on in his den. Um, hey, Graham, uh, might be low on ha Haley's this coming year. Think about putting ryegrass under peas, Italian ryegrass, yep. And then brassica and silage. So the relay mix would be great, mate. And that'll do. You know this better than anyone, Dan. You're you're a good forage guy. So Dan actually runs a dairy on forages, and has done an excellent job at it. But yeah, Italian ryegrass is a no-brainer for under that kind of situation. And another dairy farmer says sod uh, sod are bad the next year. Uh, is that true? Since it's since it's a bunch grass. Well, you got different types of sod. You got blue blue uh, bluegrass, creeping red fescue, so on and so on. So yeah, did, you know, horses for courses there too, Dan. Like um, I can get plants growing in amongst sod as well. George, uh, been grazing Italian ryegrass with forage oats for a few years. Would like to throw a rape. But scared not to, scared not being able to spray. Yeah, yeah. So get your pigweed under control. Pigweed is one of the highest feed values out of all our forages, but cattle won't eat it. But you put red root pigweed in the silage pit, it'll double your feed value. But um, you know, if you've got a weed issue problem, use use grass varieties like your Italian ryegrass, triticalian oats. Then you've got options to go and spray. Okay, but as soon as you get that under control, throw some legumes in there. You know, maybe a turnip, something easy to to uh, graze, uh, silage, green feed. But once you've got a brassica in there or anything, a C4 or a clover, then you're done when it comes to spraying. But some other guys might have some uh, ideas about that too. If anybody else has tried something, just put unmute yourself and speak up. Um, it's it's all about sharing knowledge. I always say it's not what you know, it's who you know. So uh, that can make you look like someone pretty smart. Are you seeding in one pass or putting the cereal? No, I'm all one pass. Everything, I hate driving tractors, even though I've got a seeding business, I just hate it. So what you do, this is a great question actually. If you're doing a quarter section land with cover crops, only fill the drill for 25 acres, okay? We don't want separation um, with your, with your, um, with your uh, seeds, diversity in there. And if you fill that seed hawk up to the nuts and went around seeding, then you're gonna have some problems. You're gonna have separation of the seed, right? So try and just, if you can do 25, 30 acres, one pass, fill up, and then, um, yeah, go at it again, you know, it's easy. It's not a hard thing to do. Uh, it just takes a little bit of time filling a drill up again, but yep, keep it keep it to smaller acres when you're doing a multi-species with brassicas and big seeds like cereals. So, yeah, um, I, think, I think that's the end of the questions. But like next week, uh, tomorrow night, Grant will talk about um, about uh, the the economics of all this, right? And then we can uh, we can put numbers to all this because I believe in in using numbers. There's a lot of you guys out there who are already doing this. I can see quite a few of you, and um, this is where it's about sharing your knowledge to help the next guy out, right? And so that's where Grant's going doing it tomorrow, and then next week. On Tuesday night, I'll talk about perennials, perennial establishments, cultivation versus sod seeding, and then Grant will do the economics on that. And then, um, and then to round it off, we'll get PJ down from PJ Kimmel from Turner, Montana, just on a large scale. What he does down there, uh, um, you know, with with uh, fifteen thousand acres of land and the diversity that he runs, he'll be able to just put this into a more uh, a more practical experience uh, experiences of what he's done practically. So yeah, but um, there's a lot of people here I see that you know you can share your knowledge amongst each other too. It's 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 not what you know it's who you know. So yeah, does anybody no, else have something to say? Um, just some housekeeping notes. Uh, very great presentation, Graham. 
um, your Zoom link that you use tonight will work tomorrow. So for anyone interested in listening to Grant's presentation on economics, um, the Zoom link that you use tonight will work tomorrow. Yep. And um, I will get for a perennial link out next week for the Zooms that we will be doing then. So okay. just watch your email for those. I see a question here. It's, it, I should have mentioned this, thanks. Um, everything has to go at half in seeding depth, right? Doesn't matter if you're peas or your cereals. You got to seed to your brassica, your smallest seed. It could be a clover, it could be your brassicas, but seed half in seeding depth. Don't go chasing big depths, okay? Chase moisture because you're going to get half the crop. That's why all union forage seeds are colored, they're dyed. So we've got mycorrhizal fungi, rhizobia bacteria. We've got a starter N and P. And I've seen these um, work. Uh, that's why we did it. I watch trials. I sit on uh, the Canadian Roundtable of Sandal Beef on the science chair, and then I'm on the directors of BCRC, which is the Beef Research Council of Canada. And I'm into science proves it first, then um, and then I'll then I'll adopt it. So um, so the seed is also dyed. So the annuals. Um, are dyed green, uh, are dyed yellow, and the perennials, no, the annuals are dyed green and the perennials are dyed yellow. So you can actually get out of your tractor and check the seeding depth, okay? It's really easy to do. One pass and you go out, check your drill. Yep, I'm sweet. We're off to the races. We're doing exactly that. Um, here's another. Have you done any success with fall seeding covers? No, I haven't. I've done, I've done um, fall seeding sweet clover and fall triticale, um, but everything else, Italian ryegrass, it might live, hairy vetch might live, but I haven't frost seeded any forages either because up here with the freeze and thawing effect, we get muddy, then it freezes again, then it can get muddy again, we can lose, um, we can lose some seed from rotting and, and all frost kill too. So when you say fall seeding, don't seed anything after the 15th of August, okay? That's perennials and annuals too. Annuals, you're not gonna get your big enough bang for your buck unless you do sweet clover and fall triticale, okay? So yeah, it's a bit of hit and miss. Um, pick your battles with that one as well. Uh, what's, that's when you're seeding one pass single shoot. Yep, like the, the Whatever drill you get, like my drill has got two seed boxes, seed, shotgun blender seed down one, uh, down one tube, fertilizer down the other tube at the bottom, they come out together in the ground. But if you've got a good piece of equipment, it's uh, double shooting or deep banding, or you don't need specialty equipment for this, okay? Don't go buy, you know, you've got a good seed hawk or you've got a good flexi coil or an agriplow or whatever. Make it work to your situation, okay? Mine is all uh, two seed boxes down to one tube, delivers it straight down into the into the uh, fallow where the seeds are. So, yeah. But if anyone's got any other questions, if not, what do you think, Amber? That sounds good. If anyone has any questions, you can email uh, any of the Union Forage team and we'll be happy to get back to you and uh, look forward to seeing you guys all tomorrow. Thanks, guys. Thanks very much for having me.